when you see the notification at the top, you should be good to go. And I will stop sharing. I see a notification, so let's go ahead and share my screen here, at least the presentation screen, because I don't I don't think you guys you guys care about any of the other stuff that I have going on on my computer. And that must apply for everyone in the world. Uh, there's a few so a few things here before I get started. Number one is Randolph and I have history. Uh, big time history, so I remember harassing them at a single Saturday and uh, what was it? Uh, oh, in Vancouver, a long Vancouver. time ago. Very long time and ago. I was like, and I was like, Randolph, you know you need to get going on your spe on speaking at Seagull Saturdays, right? And, you know, eventually they, they fell into, in, into the whole trap that I'd set up for them, so. Yep, yep. This is all your fault, <laughs> and, and, and it's been and it's been wonderful to to watch all of that going on. The other the other comment that I have is that you mentioned uh, the demolition of past, and it was more like an implosion. And just wanted to make that perfectly clear, um, because no 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 nobody external cost passes issues. Only internal pass cost pass to go through what they went through. Uh, anyway, that, I'm I'm done with that. I just. Uh, for uh, I guess I'd say second of all, I am extremely thankful of you guys making time to listen to me, uh, especially in the middle of still in the middle of the pandemic that's been raging for God knows how long now. Uh, uh, I have been doing this for a really long time. I, I do love uh, speaking at, and for community events and especially SQL Server community, uh, SQL Server and Azure SQL communities because they, we are so close. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the communities, we're still probably one of the best ones out there in terms of, you know, how how united we are, despite, you know, all the differences that we may have, uh, political, religious, and, uh, and of other kinds. You know, we still get together to talk about the things we love, technology, and more specifically, uh, you know, Things around SQL Server and and the uh, and products that have evolved from SQL Server. Uh, I have been working with the product for about 23 years, and you should know that uh, that uh, I don't I don't feel any smarter for having worked at at Microsoft on SQL Server engineering team or anything like that. I feel that I learned a bunch of stuff when I was there, um, and that, that was useful for me in my career. And I also learned a bunch of stuff. Uh, at this old company that I used to work for called uh, 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 Pure Storage. And at Pure Storage is when I really understood storage. And I, I, I didn't really understand storage much until, until I joined Pure. I knew the basics, uh, but I didn't really know how storage systems worked or what it got to expect from, uh, from storage subsystems. And like, you know, what I find that interesting. And, and you know, you guys please stop me if I'm derailing and talking too much. Um, and not focusing on the presentation. What I find interesting is that prior to joining Pure Storage, I would just, you know, if you told me to just test or validate a storage subsystem, I would just take, you know, SQL IO, you know, rest in peace. Now it's uh, this speed, this this speed, I guess, came to replace it. I would just run SQL IO against uh, against the device, and then I will just look at the numbers, and if the number look these, the numbers look decent, that that'll be about it. Now, if you ask me, or Janice, in 2021. How I would test and validate a storage device? Holy moly, my answer will take about 30 minutes. Um, just the answer alone. It's it's so ridiculous, right? To understand all the nuances about a given system and 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 you know, I I love it and I hate it at the same time. I love it and I hate it. Anyway, um, you will hear me say a bunch of stuff uh, that is maybe sound specific to pure storage. Because unfortunately, I was, you know, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid there for a long time. It was what close to five years of me drinking pure storage Kool-Aid. So there's a lot of that. Uh, there may be a lot of that in this presentation. I'll try not to do that though. Um, there is a there is a slide or two that have things that are specific to pure storage, but I'll try and make sure that I mention how you know the generic alternatives that exist to those things. Make sense? Because um, you know I didn't touch this this deck much, and yes, I have been delivering this deck or a similar version of this deck for a really long time now. So hope you enjoy it. Um, the things that we're going to talk about here today, um, we start with the basics of storage subsystems. 
uh, we start, we follow with the uh, basics of SQL Server I.O. We follow with uh, what, you know, basic structure of database files, transaction log files, and the file systems that they sit on top of, uh, hypervisors, uh, protocols, and devices. And lastly, uh, corollary, which is a bit of a, of a, of a religious or philosophical discussion around whether you should do block replication or file system replication uh, versus uh, logical replication. And you know, when we get there, you'll know what you'll know what I mean. Well, by the way, it's also good to see familiar faces on the call here today, and not just Randolph. Um, the basics of storage uh, subsystems. So let's start with this. Number one thing that one has to understand is latency. Okay. And latency is actually very simple to understand. Latency is how long did it take for my I/O to, to complete? Okay, your application in this, in our case, SQL Server, is just an I/O and says, "I want to, I want to write this many bytes to that to this particular offset." Well, SQL Server doesn't actually know uh, about file offsets or anything like that. But SQL Server says, "I want to write this many this many bytes." Um, that sit on this on this particular memory buffer to that particular storage device, so forth and so on. And it issues that I/O, right? It goes to the stack within SQL Server first. It goes outside of SQL Server into the Windows storage stack or Linux storage stack if you're running SQL Server on Linux. Uh, hint: If you're actually running a SQL Server on Linux, you go through the Windows stack internally within SQL PAL, and then you go externally on um, on um, on a uh, to on the SQL PAL libraries, and then you go over the Linux uh, storage st stack that's kind of implied by SQL PAL. Uh, regardless, you go through all those layers, right? You go through the application layer, you go through the operating system layer, and if you're on a VM, which most of us are using for SQL Server, uh, then you go over the, the software stack of the hypervisor itself um, before you actually hit a physical device. Uh, which is, you know, the thing that connects you to your storage device. And maybe that your storage device sits, you know, directly on a PCIe bus, for example, if you're sitting on a high-end server with PCIe attached attached storage, um, you may do that. Or if you're sitting, or if your storage sits on a SAN, uh, then you may hit an HBA, a host, a host bus adapter, to go into your storage device. Now, I'm, uh, finally, you hit that storage device, and the storage device replies with the actual I/O being completed. Now, I mentioned a bunch of stuff here, right? And I should, probably should have put this on a, on, a, on a slide, but I want you guys to think about a lot of things I said. Uh, that I/O has to go through a lot of different places. So, where do we measure latency? And the answer is that you can measure latency at any point. Right? You can measure latency at the application level. You can measure latency at the operating system level. You can measure latency at the hypervisor level. You can measure latency. Before and after leaves your HBA, if you have an HBA connected to your SAN, right? So, so for your connectivity or your network card before it you know, hits your Ethernet network, if you're using ISCSI or what have you, right? And then you can measure latency all the way at your storage device. The storage device itself has to take that incoming I.O. and then process it. But as it sits at the head or controller of your storage subsystem, um, you know, it's not processed yet. It's just sitting there. You know, at some point it will be acknowledged as completed. And that latency can be very short there, but maybe the latency is a heck of a lot longer, and it and it typically is a heck of a lot longer, or a heck of, a heck of a lot greater uh, when measured from the SQL Server point of view. And so all of this, what it does is just confuse people, right? Because the the storage vendor tells you that there's a given, given latency on the storage device. The VMware admin or the Hyper-V admin tells you something else. And then lastly, you guys are seeing something on Perfmon if you happen to be the sysadmins or Windows admins. Or, but if no, you're only DBAs, then what you're looking at is just what SQL Server sees. Maybe you looked at you know, uh, virtual log files and you see the latency as perceived by SQL Server there, which by the way is influenced by the CPU quantum is, and it's rarely um, the actual latency seen by SQL Server. Regardless, latency is just that. Latency is measuring I.O. How long did it take for an I.O. to complete? That's it. I.O. block size. This is super important. And a lot of people forget about this factor and this uh, concept and, and the fact that it's so important. When you issue an I.O., 
you provide a given number of bytes for the operation that you're going to perform. Right? So think about a write. If I want to write, I don't know, a one, let's say you did, did something and only and only modifies one page. Right? So you have one page in your buffer pool that's dirty. And when checkpoint run checkpoint runs, it has to uh, flush that one page to disk, right? So page is eight kilobytes in size, right? So that IO for the checkpoint will be eight kilobytes in size because there's only one page to issue, right? It doesn't it doesn't actually have to flush more data than it needs to. It only flushes however data you need to do at that point. And so that should get you thinking that there are times when SQL Server does operations with different IO block sizes. And indeed, that is very much the case. We're definitely going to talk about that. So effectively, how many bytes did I issue for my IO? Was it 512 bytes? Was it a kilobyte? Was it eight kilobytes? Was it a megabyte? Right? Was it more than a megabyte? Which, by the way, happens. And we'll talk about that too. So the request, right? You're replacing a request for an IO and you're passing a memory buffer in the case of a write uh, with data on it. And you want that write to be issued? Yeah, you're issuing a write with this many bytes to be written against a given file offset on, on your storage device. That's it. That's what the request actually means, or the IO block size actually means. It's never fixed. Super important for SQL Server, the IO block size is never ever fixed. IOPS goes along with IO block size. If I want to measure how many IOs I issue per second, which is effectively what IOs mean, what IOPS means, I have to take into consideration that all the operations that I'm issuing may have a different IO block sizes, and hence I have to pick a given measurement for the IO, for IOPS. So when somebody tells you, oh, my device does a million IOPS, okay, now what block size? Maybe it does a million IOPS at 412 bytes. That's not that impressive, you know, considering that 412 bytes may be only used when you have a very extremely narrow table and you're blah, blah, blah. You're only generating a log record that is super, super tiny in, in, a, given, in a given kind of system. So that's not impressive, right? But if, but if somebody tells you, you know, that, uh, that, is, that it, they can handle a million IOPS at one megabyte IO block size, that's impressive because the amount of throughput or their bandwidth generated by such very large operation performed uh, by, you know, all those IOPS at one, meg at one megabyte, you do the math, that's a lot of data that you're being transferring. That's a lot of throughput. And so that's the next thing that you should understand about throughput or bandwidth. Effectively, add it up, aggregate it, how much data am I transferring per second? You can measure bandwidth, you know, going one way, going the other way, right, so from the host to the storage or from the storage to the host, when I say host, I can mean VM, right? Because you, remember, you can measure bandwidth in different places too, right? Bottlenecks exist, exist, for example. You have a SAN and you're using a horrible connectivity between your hosts and your storage array. And, and so, you know, your machine can do gigabytes per second of throughput, but you're only getting megabytes per second of throughput or bandwidth because you have a bottleneck, right? So if you measure bandwidth at different places, you can figure out what that, what that bottleneck is. So that's, uh, those are the basic concepts here. Now, uh, I put this graphically, and well, I didn't put this graphically. Somebody at Microsoft, I believe it was Thomas Kaiser, a long, a long time ago from SQL Cat, uh, created this slide and I've been, you know, it's been handed down basically from generation to generation because Jimmy May used to, uh, used to, uh, deliver presentations on storage using this slide. And I'm, uh, somehow I ended up with a copy of it. So I use it too, because I think it's good. Uh, you have your storage device there on the right, right? All those cylinders and stuff. Hopefully you're not using cylinders anywhere. Um, not even your car. Uh -huh. um, so there's a timeline there in seconds, right? T equals zero and T equals one second. Uh, there's a, an arrow which represents transfers or IOs that are being sent from point A to point B. So the measurement of this seconds per transfer, which is the performance counter that measures latency, right? That is effectively, you know, how many, how much time did it take me for a single IO to go from my host that sits on, you know, the non-pointy end of the arrow to my storage device, right? So that's my latency, simply. 
Now, throughput is added up all those transfers that are from different sizes, right? Remember, IO block sizes. If I take all of those sizes and add them up, I don't think the math is as right on this slide, so please ignore that. Um, effectively, you know, how much data am I transferring per second? That's my throughput, right? My disk transfers per second equals my IOPS. In this case, IOPS, I have six IOs in one second, so that's six IOs, six IOPS, right? Obviously, you're, you know, I, I really hope that none of you have to deal with, with a strict subsystem that does six IOs per second. That'll be ridiculous. You know, maybe uh, I believe human writing can be faster than that. Um, anyway, uh, uh, the other measurement there, the other, the other performance counter, you know, the other concept that matters there is uh, the uh, block size effectively, the average disk bytes per transfer will tell you, uh, will indicate what your average block size is, the average uh, your request size is for your workload and a, during a, a given time. And so the other thing that I didn't mention before in the concepts is queue length. Right? So I search subsystems are all queues, right? You have a queue, you have a queue in within SQL Server. You have, a, you have queues at the operating system level. You have queues in the hypervisor. You have queues in the physical devices that sit connected to your storage device. You, say, you have queues in the storage devices themselves and then so forth and so on. You know, it's all, it's queues all the way down. I literally named one of my presentations that way uh, because that's just, that's just how it is. And uh, if those queues are sitting completely empty, that means that you do not really have much work, load, right? You're really not pushing more. Uh, and if those queues are computationally expensive, then keeping those queues filled, it's actually in benefit of throughput. Things that make sense, right? So if you have a funnel and you're injecting a lot of data at the funnel, then the faster things are going to come out of the funnel, gravity and pressure. Um, so that, that's kind of how it works. Um, search subsystems are have analog uh, concepts are analogous to real life, but regardless, you can start thinking, well, you know, if I have low latency in my storage device and I have a lot of queuing going on and I'm not generating a lot of throughput, then something's going, something's going on, right? There are things that are, as you start putting the concepts together, start making sense, right? If I have a lot of throughput and my latency is high and my queues are full, then I might have exceeded the maximum throughput out of my storage subsystem. That's typically the case, but that may not necessarily be the case, right? So, um, if you have very low latency, very high throughput, and your queuing is low, then you're in good shape, right? You're getting great, you're getting great performance. Uh, so, those these are the things that you kind of have to wrangle in your head a little bit as you manage storage subsystems, so that you can kind of guess, you know, educated guess what, as to what's going on, what's what's the uh, situation that you're facing. So, indicators, right? Anyway, the basis, basics of SQL. By the way, you guys, something I didn't mention. I hate it when we leave Q&A for the end because um, I forget about what I said five minutes ago very quickly. Uh, I have a very short buffer for uh, uh, recent memories. So please interrupt me. Just open up your mics, and if you want to talk, um, uh, we will do so in the midst of the presentation. I don't care. So anyway, basics of SQL Server I.O. Right ahead logging. Um, right ahead logging is one of the core concepts of the database engine and the implementation of uh, most RDBMS is actually in the world. So relational database management systems that uh, that are uh, transaction aware or or uh, are based on transactions like SQL Server, uh, they all follow the uh, asset properties, right? So atomicity, consistency, uh, isolation, and durability. Now durability is especially important for storage subsystems. And the way that SQL Server implements durability is by following the right ahead logging protocol. And one of the things it does by following the right ahead logging protocol, the right ahead logging protocol is to ensure durability. So how it does that is it basically just does everything based on the log, right? Everything you do in SQL Server has to be logged one way or another, okay? Maybe not fully logged, meaning you're, very, very, you're being very explicit on how you log things, right? Um, but you are logging information about what's actually taking place, but it's because if you have to roll back, whatever you're doing, you need to have enough information in your transaction log to do so. And if the system crashes, right, 
you also have to determine whether whatever whatever things you have done in your system uh, have committed or have rolled back. All the transactions in your system have committed or rolled back. And Red Hat logging and how it's performed against a transaction log in SQL Server is fundamental for you know the the well-being of your system. Now, the the specifics of this are rather complex, but I will sum it up very quickly. Anything that you write to the transaction log has to be persisted all the way through without living in an area of storage that's volatile. Fundamental. Why is that fundamental? Imagine that I write to the transaction log, right? The fact that I committed a transaction. And it lands on an area of storage that's volatile, right? Some cache, memory cache in your in the controllers of your of your storage subsystem. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a SAN. It landed in an area that's not backed by a battery and it will not survive a system crash, right? Of, of any kind in any of the stages. So the storage subsystem dies, that data is gone. Your host dies, it never knew that it, whether, whether that IO was completed or not. If that happens, upon system restart, whenever crash recovery runs on top of that transaction log, it will it will not find the information corresponding to that transaction. So that transaction that you acknowledge last committed has effectively disappeared. That's why it's important, right? You want your transaction log writes to be persisted all the way through to, to a persisted layer of storage, although it's at least considered by the storage vendor and backed by the storage vendor as a persistent area of storage. Like there are fancy storage arrays on which you write, you issue rights, and it may land on RAM. And those rights are not persistent, right? If it lands on a persistent memory device, that's different, right? Because it works like RAM, but it's actually persistent, meaning if your storage system dies, when it comes back online and SQL Server attempts to run crash recovery on top of that data, it'll find that whatever it was written before. Or maybe it sits on some RAM that's packed by a battery cache, that's protected by a UPS, and you know a a uh, a uh, a partly fossil fuel powered uh, uh, energy system behind it doesn't matter, right? You have to guarantee that if something crashes, the data will be there. So even if it's backed by a battery, if you have a hard stop on your system, a hard crash, because remember storage subsystems, most of them run software, controller, micro or microcontroller software. Right and in chips, it may be FPGAs, it may be a special circuit, but it's software in the end, right? If that contains a bug and that write that you issued is no longer found after the system restarted, we are in the same situation that we found ourselves earlier, right? Our data has disappeared. So persistence of data is super important. And you should be asking the questions whenever you have a given storage presented to you, whether that storage can persist writes right away. Then the easiest way to do that is just run SQL IO sim on top of that. SQL IO sim will verify that. We'll make sure that you know whatever you wrote is actually persisted all the way through. Right now, if your storage vendor is lying to you and lying to SQL IO sim, that storage uh, vendor will probably disappear from the market really quick. Right, and it has happened over the years actually. That somebody showed up and said, "Oh yeah, my storage subsystem compliance with all that. It won't be a problem. It won't be a problem for SQL Server. It only takes one failure for that storage vendor to lose all its all, all of the credibility, and no, no one ever to use them again." So I said a lot of things about the fact that you know the rights have to be persistent. That is the the only thing that you should really understand. Whenever you write to the transaction log. By the way, there's other cases where persistent writes all the way through are necessary, like log backups, for example. Uh, it's all, it's another um, it's an it, it's a case where you'd really need to understand, you know, the persistence layer for your storage subsystem. That's about it. So checkpoint and lazy, lazy writer. This is this generates. You can imagine write ahead logging generates its own its own storage pattern, right? Depending on your workload, you may be logging less, logging more. You know, you're going to read things from the log if you're doing things like replication or CDC or what have you. Uh, if you're doing AGs, you're going to generate some other kind of pattern, right? So that's one pattern. Um, checkpoint and lazy writer, what they do is that they take dirty buffers sitting in, in your buffer pool 
and they flush them down to your data files. But they don't necessarily have to issue those IOs with um, uh, with persistence, right? All the way through, no cache, right? Why is that? Well, number one, it, that can probably give them an itch in terms of performance, and checkpoint can be a very bursty operation, right? Because you don't run checkpoint all the time. It's not like you flush every page every time you modify it. No, you don't. You just wait for checkpoint to to to, mod to, uh, to effectively flush that 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 uh, dirty buffer for you and flush that page or that extent or that series of extents um, into uh, from the buffer pool down into your storage. Uh, but that uh, the aggregation of all of those extents being modified, all those pages being modified, can indeed become a throughput intensive operation. And as a matter of fact, in a, story, in a busy system, you will see it. You'll literally see it. The bandwidth on your system may be like this, and then all of a sudden there's a spike when checkpoint runs. You see it, and there, it can get so bad that the database engine, SQL Server, uh, has a, a, a tunable, a, a knob for you to limit the amount of throughput that it can uh, that it can uh, issue when when issuing checkpoint or lazy write operations. If you must know, it's the dash k SQL Server dot exe parameter, and so you can pass the pass a parameter to uh, change the behavior of checkpoint in SQL Server. Regardless, what I'm trying to say is, you can kind of picture that writing to the log is a it's a it's a latency intensive operation, right? Because I want to write to that log, and so I can do stuff in my system right away, right? If I don't write to my log, I can't really move on. Right? If it takes me too long to write to the log, you're miserable. And so when that should tell you that whenever you can place your log in the fastest storage subsystem that you, you that you have available to you, you should do that because that will give you the best performance. That's just how it works, right? Um, and obviously that's a generalization, right? Sometimes you have databases that you just don't care about. If if it's fine, if the person behind that that query takes you know it takes them 20 hours to get that result back then fine whatever right but on a busy system that you want the best performance on you should place your log in the fastest persistent storage that you have available to you um, in checkpoint you should place your data files in probably the most throughput intensive io uh, storage subsystem that you can get that doesn't generate a lot of latency right that keeps the latency low for even for individual ios so you see how these things start getting interesting. Uh, when do you need a storage subsystem that is, you know, first of all, the first question you may ask yourselves, or you may be asking yourself is, is there a storage subsystem that's fantastic and it solves all my problems and there, you know, it handles every workload with no problem? The answer to that is no. It doesn't matter which vendor you're talking to, there is no perfect storage, period. Okay, you have to pick and choose between the different offerings to say, okay, this is actually well suited for my SQL Server workload, right? Um, and uh, the other thing is, you should also understand, you know, what kind, what your workload pattern is. And I'm talking you through them so you guys can picture in your head what that looks like based on your uh, storage, uh, on your, on given your workload and your storage subsystem, how to match the two. Bulk operations is another interesting aspect of how you do things in SQL Server, right? You're not really writing much to the transaction log with bulk operations because you're only saying, I'm about to modify these extents. I'm doing things to these extents, nothing else, right? The extents get allocated in your buffer pool and then you start dumping data into them, right? Uh, and so sometimes you have eager writes, meaning when you're issuing bulk operations against uh, the buffer pool, immediately those things get written into the data files. Uh, that you don't wait for checkpoint and lazy writing to happen. So you see, that's another pattern that will show you different things on your storage subsystem as you make those modifications to uh, to your database. Now, asynchronous I/O is a fundamental thing of SQL Server. Not even transaction log writes are asynchronous in SQL Server, meaning SQL Server doesn't actually wait for acknowledgement of that I/O ever. It doesn't. So there are things that happen in SQL Server that may time out. I'd like to, when you execute a query, that query, the command exec, uh, execution time of that query may time out by the application. SQL Server won't actually, won't actually stop a query on its own unless you've configured some things. Uh, the connection, the connection may time out, right? But on its own, SQL Server won't actually say, oh, that IO just took too long, I'm gonna cancel it. Because the engine doesn't work like that, right? The engine expects your storage subsystem to be available all the time and to be responsive. So it just sits and waits and waits 
Um, but it doesn't wait for it with twiddling, twiddling its, th its thumbs. What it does is that it issues the I.O. and then it constantly checks to see if any I.O.s have been have been completed. Right. So one thread may pick up, you know, you have a worker uh, uh, worker thread working on a given task, right? And it's it's going to issue that I.O. against a, a whatever it is. So let's say, you know, you have a log write. Something generated enough log records and, you know, that, that thread is now has now issued uh, a, a log write. So, so it goes over says, hey, I need, you know, I need to write this many bytes uh, to this particular log file at this particular offset. Just go for it. And then what happens is that thread that issued that I.O. Immediately after it's done with that I.O., it, it's available to for somebody else to use. Right, some other some other uh, task can be scheduled on top of that thread, and so the first thing that every that every thread in SQL Server does when it starts is, do I have any I/O? Do I have any I/Os that are that are have completed and need to be attend need to be te uh, attended, right? And need to need to be processed as now that that I/O has been complete. Well, so that's how it works, right? The engine will make some other thread. May handle the I/O that you that another thread wants to shoot. That's how asynchronous I/O works within SQL Server itself. Now, that doesn't mean that SQL Server is like, you know, constantly checking to see if any one particular I/O was issued. It just knows that I/Os eventually get get figured out, get sorted out by the operating system and acknowledged as completed. So it picks them up, right? So complete completion routines and all that. Uh, but it doesn't actually sit and wait for I/O to complete. This is why you have wait stats, right? Like, what are you waiting on? And SQL Server may actually be waiting on I/O to complete, right? But that's a given query may be waiting for I/O to complete, or you know, maybe may a particular uh, physical execution of that query may be waiting for I/O to complete. Well, SQL Server on itself, it's not waiting for it, right? It it issued that I/O and it's just if it knows that it eventually will will happen, and this is why it's. The engine is designed to handle things such as your storage subsystem being ridiculously slow and you having IOs that complete in over 15 seconds. And then you get that magnificent error in your error log that says, oh, your error, your IO to the these many IOs took way long to complete uh, in, uh, for uh, this particular database. This is how SQL Server works, right? So asynchronous IO is a fundamental concept of it. The other thing is that that's critical is uh, if you see in your error log, if you see this 15 second thing, you know, you should be screaming. Like the, there's there's no reason on earth that you should have any system waiting, you know, with, with a latency of 15 seconds. That's that's ridiculous. You should you should be saying something about it. You should be telling your folk your, your the folks who manage your systems that it's unacceptable and you need to size it and you need to do whatever, right? Or the workload maybe doesn't fit anymore. Like, let's figure it out. <laughs> Attend to that issue because it's going to make everything worse from there. It's only downhill from there. And if you ever see a message in your error log saying that SQL Server is actually issuing synchronous I/O, oh my God, do you need to start pulling your hair? I'd like, I don't have hair to pull, but if I had hair to pull, I would pull that hair. Okay, if I saw that message, because what it means is that SQL Server is actually dedicating its threats to wait for I/O. Taking threats away from the rest of your processing, and that is a problem, a big problem, right? And that does happen occasionally, especially when you have mismatched sector sizes. And you guys, you guys may be connecting the dots in your heads right now. When you have, you know, a sector size of 512 byte on one of your availability group replicas, and the other ones are are using four kilobyte sector sizes in your drives. Uh, that's when it happens. And then you start seeing synchronous I/O, and then the performance is tanking, tanking bad. So be, keep an eye out for that. So I, I've already kind of inferred this, right? SQL Server never actually issues I/O of any given size. Uh, I'm sorry, or constantly of any given size. It always fluctuates in I/O block sizes. Now it may just, you know, because of repeatability, you may see patterns in your workload, right? And this go with your Business cycles typically. So, for example, you're gonna have you have some reports that run that run a given way. You have a, you know like I work in 
I work in uh, in HCM, so human capital management, HR systems. So we we sell you payroll stuff. So if you want to run your payroll on top of us, you can. And by the way, we do have offices in Canada. Um, point is, when you run payroll, that's a business cycle. That's literally a business cycle, right? You every in 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 our case, every fifteen days, you get paid, right? Every every you know twice a month, you get paid, and so. You know, for other people at different intervals. So you see, you will see in your SQL servers, likewise, like, uh, likewise, uh, patterns for what you're what you're experiencing in your business, and your storage subsystems will very much reflect that as well. Right? Point that I'm trying to make is, there's never something constant. You're not always issuing 64k IOs. That's a myth, and you should please never perpetuate it. Right? People confuse. NCFS allocation unit sizes with IO block sizes. And they call the, the AU size, the allocation unit size, block. It's not that. Okay, so stop calling it that. It doesn't make sense to call it that because guess what? An NCFS allocation unit is nothing other than a divide and conquer strategy for the file system to cope with a lot, a lot, a lot of files that are large in size potentially or smaller in size potentially. So that that an NCFS allocation unit, it's kind of analogous to what an extent is in SQL, on SQL Server. An extent is nothing but a logical grouping of pages. A an allocation, an alloca I'm sorry, an allocation unit is nothing but a logical grouping of sectors in your disk. That's it. There's nothing else to it. It doesn't actually drive I/O, just like SQL Server doesn't drive I/O on a on a per extent basis all the time. It doesn't, right? It may do some operations that are based on extents, like for example, instead of fetching one page to suffice a query, it may actually bring the entire extent that that page sits on because of blast radius, right? Typically, you're gonna bring in the page the page right next to the one that you're using right now. That's how the database engine works, and it uses that heuristic to kind of try, try to th make things better. But it's not like log IO is 64 kilobytes in size. It's not. Look at that table, right? If you have a disk sector size of 512 bytes, the, the smallest transaction log write that you will issue will be that of that sector size, 512 bytes, which also means that if you have a sector size of four kilobytes, you would also issue that as the smallest IO that you can issue for your transaction log, because that's what's considered atomic on a storage subsystem, a sector size. Okay, and so don't ask me why, but somebody picked 60 kilobytes as the maximum size for a for a full transaction log flush that that may or may not include more than one log record. Okay. Somebody told me, and I already forgot. It was such a silly thing that I, I, I was like, okay, that's really close. Um, anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is not even for transaction log writes is the I.O. block size constant. It's not. So it can be as small as 512 bytes, or it can be 60 kilobytes in size. So this is why when you have a very intensive OLTP workload that it's generating a lot of transaction log records, you see that the average block size against the device or against the transaction log file specifically is 60 kilobytes in size. Excuse me. And uh, you in the table, you see all the other things that SQL Server does, not extensive, right? Or I should say, a bunch of other things that SQL Server does, not necessarily extensive. That list is far from extensive, right? Uh, but you get the idea. A checkpoint can issue maybe one page only, or it can scatter, scatter, gather one megabyte worth of pages and flush all of those down to your storage device at the same time. It's crazy. Uh, when you're doing an in, so think about a data warehousing or analytic kind of query that needs to scan an index. If you're scanning an index, it would make little sense to scan the, that index eight pages at the time, eight kilobyte pages at the time, right? One page at a time. Add, add what what does it add what does it add latency right because you're issuing that uh, those eight kilobyte do be issuing those eight kilobyte IOs one at a time incurring into the latency cost for that block size and by the way this should also get you thinking that yes different block sizes may have different latency responses from your storage subsystem that is typically the case um 
But po- the point that I was trying to make is, as you issue a lot of I.O., every I.O. incurs into latency, and that latency aggregated can just be a mess. And in, in the case of our, it can be really bad for the workload. And in the case of our an index scan, it makes sense for the engine to be aggressive and fetch a lot more extents than just one, right? Because it's very likely that you're going to need the extent right next to it, or you're going to need a ton of extents next to it, which is what Enterprise Edition does. It fetches a whole bunch of extents. Standard Edition only fetches two, right? Two at a time, which is 100 kilo, and 20 and 28 kilobyte IOs. Anyway, you see workloads and backup restore. Backup restore is my favorite thing to destroy storage subsystem with because it's so easy to do, right? You're issuing one megabyte size IOs very simply with a backup command, right? You have to read your entire database with, your, with a full backup, at least you have to, right? And then you have to not only stress the CPU to compress that workload, which it does, stress the CPU a little bit, um, and then, or God forbid, you're, you're using one of those third-party products for backup, and you have that compression setting, uh, setting all the way all the way to eleven, so that it so that it actually turns into what should be a throughput intensive operation into a CPU intensive operation and trash trash your CPU while your backups open, right? So yes, indeed, Randolph, you can ma- uh, manipulate the backup block size. It's actually one of the few things that, uh, where you can tune the AO block size in SQL Server. So with blocks, uh, the max transfer size is the setting that you're thinking about. That's the one that allows you to um, decrease or increase the uh, block size. Right? By default, it's one megabyte, but you can bring it as, as small as 64 kilobyte, or you can make it as large as four megabytes in size. Right? So you can imagine that you know, it's easy to trash your SQL Server by just issuing those one megabyte block size reads right? during the backup. Make sure that you have you know, tons of different database files sitting on, on different logical volumes, so you can issue multiple threads, and they just completely hog your SQL Server from just the reads for backups. And at the same time, you you're, can destroy a target device that you're backing up to, right, by backing up uh, backing up to uh, to Stripe set and, you know, so forth and so on. But maybe you're doing that intentionally because you're backup to, you want your backup to finish extremely fast. As a matter of fact, most of us want our backups to finish fast. Because that also means, uh, hopefully, you can retrieve that backup and restore it fast. Hopefully, you're testing that. This is why we, people in the people in the community, we talk so much about testing your restores because that gives you a baseline for how long it will take you to actually restore your backups in the event of an emergency or when you actually need them. Anyway, please, again, you guys haven't said much, and I keep talking and talking and talking, and I'm getting tired of hearing myself. So, what I I want you guys to ask any questions. Please do if you have any. Um, if not, I'm just going to keep going. This is a fairly common uh, effect of the Calgary user group. We are quiet, so we love the sound of your voice. So, <laughs> so the, please, the group ahead. may be quiet. I know you are not quiet. Yes, but I inherited them. <laughs> okay, fine. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about. Be nice to us. This is not cool, man. <laughs> it's busy learning. All right. So, database files, transaction log files, and file systems. Now, I'm going to talk about file systems specifically, right? Your, your database files, so your transaction log files, sit on a, happen to sit on a file system, okay? There are some situations where you don't really need a file system, right? So, if you think about, uh, if you think about um, um, the... Uh, what are the uh, the tables that you place in the cloud? I right? forget the name of that feature. Um, there's there's a, you can extend some tables so that a portion of the table actually lands on Azure Blob. Right? Azure Blobs are not file systems; and they're just object storage. And you know, there's not the concept of an NTFS file system or an REFS file system underneath it. Right? On Windows boxes, you on there's two kinds of storage devices. Right? There's the Block devices, right, on which you present a volume to Windows oper- the Windows operating system. You format that volume with a given uh, file system, and then you optionally you create partitions on it, or you just leave you know a single partition on that whole volume for your database to use. Uh, the the two uh, supported by SQL Server uh, file systems that you will place your database transaction log files on on Windows are NTFS and REFS. And this is where our genesis has a strong opinion. NTFS has been around for decades, literally. 
and it's like one of the most tested pieces of code on human history, right? Because like literally millions of computers worldwide or potentially billions of computers worldwide are running, are, are sitting on top of NTFS uh, file systems. And placing your SQL Server database files on it, you know it's a safe bet, right? REFS, Microsoft says that it's tried and tested and they have like, I don't know how many SQL servers running on top of it in Azure SQL. Okay, cool. Uh, you can take the word for it if you want. I don't want to be in the receiving end of an REFS bug. And just like I was on the receiving end of an NTFS bug back in 1999. Um, just don't want to be in that situation. If I had to pick for SQL Server where to place my database files, I will go NTFS every time. Now, there are things that you should know about NTFS. The fact that it has a lot of knobs, right? It's not just formatted and set and forget it. You have to pick things like the NTFS allocation unit size, which, guess what? Microsoft's recommendation of 64 kilobytes is what caused the whole myth of, you know, SQL Server use, using a, SQL, a 64 kilobyte IO block size. Remember what I just told you. Um, but block size is an NTFS allocation unit size. There's also a bunch of other things that you may want to do when you format a, an NTFS uh, file system. Like for example, something called the large uh, FRS, the file record segment. You may want to enable that because that helps with some situations, like when you have an underlying database snapshot and you're doing things to that snapshot, like what CheckDB does, right? So there are some situations that get um, alleviated uh, by the fact that you have you know, a larger uh, NTFS allocation unit size, and potentially when you use that larger FRS uh, setting on your file system. A REFS just happens to be a little bit better for those situations. Like it's a, uh, it can handle metadata certainly better than what NTFS can do at scale. Um, but we're talking millions of files and so forth and so on, and you know, it doesn't have that underlying issue so much but still has its own issues. Regardless, I give you my opinion on this and you should probably ignore it because you should do your own research and figure out what's best for you here. SMB is a, is a uh, network protocol, okay? And a, as a network protocol, you're not really accessing block devices, right? You're not really, you're not really saying, I want to issue an IO against this offset in this particular volume which is what ends up happening underneath the hood at a block device, right? Uh, the protocol is as simple as this. The host says, in the, this volume, this particular offset, write this many bytes or read this many bytes. It's as simple as that. That's the, uh, over, the simplest thing that happens in a storage subsystem that's a block-based device. On a network-based storage device, right, like a NAS, uh, you would have operations that are based on file systems. Right uh, on network file system. So you would say, I have this particular path, right? I want you to write these many bytes into this uh, offset for this particular path, not this particular volume. Okay, so that's kind of how that's kind of how it works uh, at the at the lowest level there. And on SMB shares, you not 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 only can you place backup files, which is typically what you guys would use SMB shares for. Uh, older versions of SMB will be called CIFIS. So if you use you if you hear the word CIFIS, hopefully you're deprecating that word in favor of SMB. Uh, those will be you know places where you will land your SQL Server backups. Now, uh, it just so happens that in SMB devices uh, that devices that speak SMB, you can also place database files on them, right? Provided that you have the right version of SMB. Uh, offered by that storage device, you can potentially place your, your database files and your transaction log files in it. Now, this may be the case when you're doing things like data warehouses and a device that does a lot of throughput and you don't really care much about the latency and SMB is a great offering for that. You know, the storage device that you have has a great, uh, is great for that and it speaks SMB and doesn't speak block. Okay, right? And so, I'm going to answer that question in just a second, Randolph, by the way. I know I knew that was coming, but anyway. And no, Chris, SMB is not being phased out. As a matter of fact, 
enhancements are being made constantly to the SMB stack, including uh, Windows Server 2022 that just came out, has a bunch of stuff that's new for the SMB stack. On Linux, there are things that are analogous to uh, NTFS and RFS, um, so fast systems that are used for Linux, yes. So SMB 1.0 is deprecated. Um, SMB 2 you probably shouldn't use, um, not, not unless you absolutely have to. Um, new versions of, of SMB, like 3 and 3.1, are probably best for um, your SQL Server workloads and your backups because it has a bunch of security issues. If you have any devices that speak SMB 1.0 only in your network, you should probably throw those away. Um, anyway, on Linux, I also have a strong opinion here, right? But it's not so much of a, you know, our genesis is the only one that thinks that way. I think everyone is probably in agreement that XFS is the best file system for Linux on block, okay? Uh, for SQL Server on Linux on block. That's because most of the investments that are being made by the storage, uh, by the, uh, sorry, the Linux um, uh, vendors of the big houses of Linux, like Red Hat and SUSE, are on the XFS stack and not so much on the EXT4 stack, which is the other file system that SQL Server on Linux supports. If I had my way on SQL Server on Linux every time, I would pick XFS over EXT4. There are, or there used to be, back in the day, marginal, like ridiculously marginal differences in performance where EXT would have an advantage in very weird edge cases over XFS. But I believe that by now they, they probably have figured out, you know, uh, or have optimized those, those particular edge cases for XFS as well. Uh, NFS, Network File System, is uh, a analogous to SMB on, on the Linux side of the world, the Unix side of the house. Okay, that's been around for decades, literally. And that protocol can be used for two things. Backups on SQL Server Linux, right? You can place your backups on NFS shares uh, or uh, even placing your database files on, a, on NFS devices as well. Did I say SMB? NFS, right? So and, and, and on NFS devices, you can place your transaction log and your database files as well, right? The has, you have to follow a given version of NFS, just like you do in SMB. You have to be running SMB version of NFS version 4.2 in order for you to place your database files or your transaction log uh, files or for SQL Server Linux on top. Um, done with that slide, hopefully you don't have any questions, but if you do, let me know. If you guys think all of this gets complex, when I was talking about stacks and all this, you have no idea, right? It gets incredibly complex. Thing is that, you know, people like to simplify things and try to not think about, not, not to think about all the possible combinations of what could possibly go wrong. And trust me, in storage subsystems, there is a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, I don't expect you guys to squint at the the, your screen and try, try to make up what I'm trying to say in this slide. What I'm trying to say with this slide is this stuff is complex. There's a lot of things. That is the Windows storage, storage subsystem stack as it was a few years ago. And then by a few years ago, I mean when they would say that for uh, that excellent rights, cached rights will be under one millisecond and actually uh, non cached rights. Uh, you know, will be will be good for like I don't know, like four minutes. There's a lot of nonsense in there. My the point that this is trying to make is this is a few years. The point I was trying to make is this is a few years old, quite a few years old at this point, and things have changed since. Not simplify things, but to make things more complex, unfortunately. And one of the things that people do a heck of a lot is if you see the third box from the top from going top to bottom. It says upper filter drivers. That is the layer of the file system where anti-malware uh, software sits on top of. So if you're if you're running an anti-malware in your system, an antivirus on your system, it's literally hooked up into that layer of your file system so that it can do, guess what? Crack open every single thing that you read or write to your file system. Does that sound like something that you would want to do in your SQL Server? Absolutely not. And it's so it's such an absolute no way that you will ever want to do that. That I don't even want an antivirus installed on a SQL Server. Like my me personally, 
I would never install an antivirus on a SQL Server. There's just no good reason for it, right? Everything that you can monitor on SQL Server, you can monitor outside of SQL Server. Um, and especially when it comes to Windows and Linux, when it comes to I.O., right? You shouldn't mon you know, try to make up what SQL Server is trying to read or write from disk because it's not malicious. SQL Server on its own is not malicious, right? We're not talking solo wins here. Um, it's it's a completely different mentality when you have a database server, right? It's just writing pages back and forth uh, from disk and things uh, things to a transaction log. Um, anyway, the uh, the comment that I, the other comment that I wanted to make uh, regarding this is, if you have to install an antivirus in your SQL Server, when then you probably want to disable uh, reading and writing from the database files. Because uh, you want to exclude your database files from them, including your backups. Because like I said before, in the case of transaction log backups specifically, if SQL Server has to issue a synchronous I.O., now you have to add the cost of your anti-malware solution, cracking open everything that you write, and trying to figure out if that is a good thing or a bad thing written by some kid in Russia. Like, you don't, you don't, this is not the thing that you should care about in SQL Server, and you should just disable all that nonsense. Hypervisors. I just wanted to highlight this. All that complexity that I showed on the previous slide, that is just what sits on the storage subsystem, not even the entire application subsystem, which SQL Server is very complex and has a lot of those. That is just what runs inside of one of the guest VMs that run on top of all that. So like the blue thing, the uh, the blue layer there, the blue little, 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 uh, you know, area. That that's just one VM, right? Running all that complex code in there, and you have all these things that are underneath the hood of that, right? And your VMs are typically running things in user mode, meaning they're not. Uh, you're not really switching your CPU into kernel mode, mode these days to issue I/O from your VMs, right? Your VMs are just requesting something of the hypervisor in the end. The hypervisor just says, "Okay, let me let me try to do my best here with that particular request." And that's exactly what happens. So your hypervisor essentially makes, or well, almost makes, no guarantees about anything. Um, it'll try to give you CPU when you ask for CPU. It'll try to give you memory when you want memory. You can make a reservation of memory or a reservation of CPU, but typically the uh, the uh, hypervisor vendors will tell you not to do that. Um, and then, uh, or maybe they let you memory and not, but not CPU. Anyway, you're, in the end, all you're doing with a hypervisor is to share hardware, right? This is why in the cloud all you run is VMs because you know they don't want you to take any 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 one given host unless you pay for it. And if you have looked at the cost of specific store uh, dedicated hosts uh, or even physical hosts that some that some uh, uh, that some uh, cloud vendors like to sell you, it gets expensive really quick, right? So you're you're basically taking real estate on the data center at that point, and that's that's a problem, a, a, a problem that gets that gets only dealt with money. Right. Um, anyway, all I'm trying to say is, it doesn't matter if you run any of these guys, right? You are going through something like this. This is a VMware specific stack. I get it, but I'm trying to highlight one thing. If your if your hypervisor uh, or your VMs are poorly configured, you're not gonna ha you're gonna have a lot of extra work on the hypervisor because you're trying to deal with a VM that doesn't really play well, play nice with that hypervisor. Right? If you're issuing I.O. and your hypervisor has to handle I.O. in kernel mode for that particular VM, there's a lot of I.O. IO context switching between user mode and, uh, or VM, and, and VMs uh, when, it, when it comes to that, that part of the code to handle that I.O. So a lot of hypervisors these days, including VMware, have these things uh, that are called uh, paravirtual drivers, right? Not just for SCSI, but a whole, for, for a whole bunch of other things, so that you don't have to transition between user mode and kernel mode just to handle I/O, whether it's regular storage I/O or it's network I/O. Okay, so this is uh, something that's important to kind of understand. You have all this complexity when it comes to storage. The hypervisor being poorly configured, your VMs being poorly configured, only adds to that and can make your life you know, 20%, 30% worse. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking performance numbers, right? Obviously. Um, hopefully it's clear though. 
Use the facilities that your hypervisor give you to achieve better performance in the I.O. side. Right? If you don't, you're 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 losing. You're basically losing uh, free performance. In in the case of VMware specifically, if you enable the uh, virtual SCSI driver on your on your database volumes or your database disks, virtual disks, that's free performance. And it's, you don't have to do much. You just have to offline your VM, change your SCSI adapters, and light it up again. Right? It's not doesn't take a lot of work. When you build your VM software, you're using that. Anyway, move on. Um, protocols, really quick. Uh, SCSI is a beast, an animal that's been around for 40 years. Hard to believe it, but it's been around for that long, right? Um, and so SCSI is a protocol that was designed to be a broad uh, protocol that can handle a myriad of storage devices. It was designed to handle tape. It was designed to handle disk. It was designed to handle all the things that people don't even use anymore, right? Um, people still use tape, by the way. Um, the point with the, the, that I wanted to make about SCSI is that SCSI is dying. SCSI is basically something that needs to be eradicated from the face of the earth because there are things to replace it. If you ever hear about SATA, SATA is a special way of accessing media and disks and the protocol. Run. You should not be using SATA for anything. So I won't even mention what it actually does. I'll just skip it. Just don't, just run, okay? Fiber channel though. It sounds like Fiber channel is really old and it kind of is, right? It's been around for a, while, for a really long time. But Fiber channel is actually really good for storage area networks, okay? Fiber channel is both a protocol, meaning you're gonna be accessing your storage devices uh, uh, using that protocol, your storage network, or your search array using the device, but and a media type. So, so there are some disks that only speak that particular protocol. Okay, just so like there are disks that only speak, uh, uh, that only speak SATA, for example. There are disks that are only fiber channel disks that can only speak that particular protocol. Right. So, what happens to fiber channel is that typically you have SCSI requests being placed on top of fiber channel. Okay, that's that's how it goes. Um, and likewise, you have iSCSI. iSCSI is more of a uh, more of a protocol that's used for uh, routing, right? Your I/O requests, your SCSI requests over a network, just like Fiber Channel does. Fiber Channel is also a searchable uh, network, uh, so you can have you know uh, you can share storage devices and, and do all the interesting things. iSCSI, much in the same way, is searchable and routable. You can connect to a SCSI iSCSI device that sits you know, halfway across the internet. Hopefully you're not doing that, but much in the sense that you actually access S3 devices today in Amazon and your computer sits, you know, at home or your or your data center, um, you could do that with iSCSI as well. It's actually a good protocol still. And with the newer improvements that have been made to Ethernet networks and the iSCSI protocol itself, um, the marginal gains in performance you will get from going fiber channel over iSCSI have effectively faded out. So if you're using 40 gig, 40 gig, 40 gigabit Ethernet and so forth and so on. ISCAS is probably going to run at, at, at a very good speed uh, comparable to Fiber Channel. The one thing that you should know about is that there's a new kid in the block regarding protocols. That's MVME, Non Volatile Memory Express. I don't know why it's called that way, but it's ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's a protocol that was really designed to also be a broad, broad spectrum protocol. It can be used as, I guess, a lot of different media. But it has at its core, eff effectively, a very highly parallel design, right? It's designed to be not as chatty, but really able to handle a lot of different I.O. happening at the exact same time, which is how much, most storage subsystems today uh, can be accessed, right? Especially those who are based on flash or are based on, uh, on Optane memory, right? So 3D cross point. Those devices don't really benefit from you issuing sequential I/O, right, one I/O after the other, but rather open up a lot of different queues and start if you're issuing I/O against them. That's how you get the best performance out of them, the most IOPS and the most throughput out of them. And so, just like SCSI is by itself not a routable protocol, and you have to encapsulate it on top of Fiber Channel or SCSI, there is MVME over Fabric, 
which allows you to encapsulate NVMe requests, NVMe being the protocol, right, uh, that end up on a storage device over a routable or switchable network. And there's a ton of flavors of NVMe upper fabric. There's there's a there's NVMe upper fabric over uh, over uh, Rocky V2, for example, which is RDMA over converged Ethernet V2. That is an Ethernet network. It looks like a nice SCSI network, but it's so much better, right? Um, there's also NVMe over TCP, for example. So now you can do routable, you know, over the internet requests, right? And some of the cloud uh, vendors are actually actively looking into NVMe over TCP. It's an interesting one. Um, the lower lowest latency one that I've seen thus far, uh, NVMe over fabrics. Uh, for a routable storage network, uh, for a switchable storage network, NVMe over fabric far exceeds uh, most of the other protocols in terms of performance. So it's a very, very good protocol. And I will say mainstream purpose protocols. There are, there are others that we never hear about because SQL Server is not supported on top of them. Now, NVMe is something that Windows supports by default, but not NVMe over fabric natively. There is no native support for NVMe over fabric, but if you're running on top of VMware, for example, or running on Linux, you can leverage NVMe over fabric from those hosts. Um, uh, because they do have uh, baked in support for NVMe over fabric. The Windows Server team has decided not to roll out native. I, I heard they were considering it. I don't know if that's true or not, um, whether they're actually going to roll out NVMe over fabric support natively. I would, I would argue that not doing so, it's kind of like slapping the face for the customers because this is where the, indu the industry is going in general. Right? Most of the storage industry is switching in favor of NVMe and NVMe over fabric. If you're here, otherwise it's just probably marketing uh, because they want to sell you something else. But that's a uh, that's that's really what's happening uh, in most of the, in the storage industry out there. So this is a a device a slide that contains pure storage specific devices. And remember that this is a presentation that I wrote while I worked at pure storage, but I don't work there anymore. I just wanted to highlight kind of different storage devices and what you would expect from them. At the top left, you have a persistent memory device. A persistent memory device, it's essentially the same as a uh, as a uh, as the DRAM that you have on your on your computer, with the exception that it can actually persist the data. So when your computer dies, everything in DRAM is considered gone, right? Because you, you cannot read from DRAM that well, after your system reboots or restarts, right? Or it's turned off and turned back on. Uh, but on store in persistent memory devices, that data that is sitting there is actually there forever. When you once you write it, it's considered persistent and, and it will be there upon a system or upon a system restart. Writing to persistent memory devices, depending on which one you use, can take only a few nanoseconds. Go figure how fast. Uh, or just on the very low end microsecond, a single digit microsecond, or maybe two digit microsecond if you're under you know, extreme, extreme duress kind of kind of scenario. But system memory devices are very, very good also in terms of throughput. They may be limited by how much throughput you can get per device, right? Uh, on a um, on the memory bus. And so how much bandwidth your memory bus can handle, that may limit, you know, on a per socket to memory socket kind of uh, limitations there in terms of how much bandwidth individually they can generate. Um, and so what happens with persistent memory devices is you can actually access them as if they were memory. And so SQL Server has actually embraced this with features like hybrid, hybrid buffer pool. I'm not gonna talk about it here, but you can go check that out. It's one of the features we ha we handle in the SQL Server engineering team while I was there rolling out 2019. Um, the idea behind uh, using persistent memory devices as if it were memory is that you're avoiding the entire software stack that is baked within the operating system just to do I.O. Because you don't have to, right? You have a device that you can access as memory. Why wouldn't you use it as memory? So whenever possible, you should try to leverage those features and leverage your storage memory and your persistent memory devices um, using hopefully user mode based uh, methods, methods of accessing it so that you don't even have to, you know, switch context uh, within your CPU just to issue an I.O. against them. And so that's a, uh, that is super important for performance on storage uh, pers uh, persistent memory devices. Uh, they are slow, slow on the uptake, right? On, in the cloud, there's 
few offerings to have that these days. Um, I would guess that, you know, in five years or so, we're going to see like widespread adoption of persistent memory devices out there. Um, so you're, you're going to see, you're going to see and hear a lot more about these. Uh, and I'm excited about that because it changes the game in so many ways. Now, persistent memory devices, you can actually access as if they were block devices too, right? So you go over the entire operating system storage stack to access the actual persistent memory device. Yes, you can run antivirus on top of them, not that you would want to, of course. Well, that's what I'm trying to imply by the fact that you can access them as if you were a block device. Uh, so if you needed to safeguard or double check whatever's happening against them, you could, I guess. Um, on the top right, you have a PCIe attached uh, uh, or a PCIe enabled uh, Intel Optane drive. So Optane's uh, is a medium uh, that uh, Intel you see, that's the marketing name for a medium called 3D Crosspoint. It was jointly developed by Intel and Micron years ago. Now, the bus where it sits is no longer the memory bus as if, as if you know, it were a memory device. It's more like a graphics card or GPU on your, on your gaming PC or the GPU on your laptop, right? It's that same bus, the PCIe bus. And that bus is extremely fast in terms of bandwidth. Uh, and it can also offer single digit microsecond latency or double digit microsecond latency. The bad ones actually get you into the millisecond range. Uh, so if you remember Fusion IO cards, they were they were PCIe attached um, or PCI because it wasn't PCIe back then. I don't, re I don't remember revisions and all that. There's, there's been some, some, so many things going on uh, with that uh, or it's evolved over time. Regardless, latency is very, very good. Throughput can be incredible. But the, the, those two devices at the top have a fundamental problem, and it is that they sit inside of your host, right? uh, whether a virtualization host or a dedicated server, a bare metal server that you're running SQL Server on top of. If you lose that host, where, what do you, how do you get that data out? Right? You are hoping that your host didn't go up in flames and it actually consume, the flames didn't consume your, your persistent memory device or your PCIe attached storage, right? You are hoping that that, da that data will be there if you physically remove the cards or the uh, or the or the uh, persistent memory uh, device from your 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 computer host. You can attach them to another one and read the data there, but that's not really great for high availability, right? So what people do is that they use all the mechanisms for replicating data within those devices. So that if you do lose the host, you have that data safeguarded somewhere else. So they use availability groups, they use file system replication stuff like SIOs or, or, or uh, storage replica on Windows Server. They use hypervisor-based storage replication stuff like VMware SRM, so forth and so on. They, people use a whole bunch of different things to, just to get that data replicated from those devices that give you excellent performance but they have to be attached to the bus, right? And they have to be attached to the, your the motherboard or uh, in your in your in your servers. And so, this is also why when you have these memory these devices, top uh, in in Azure or AWS or GCP, they are no no longer persist considered persisted, right? Because you're running VMs that sit on top of hosts. That have that kind of storage, but you can only really rely on that storage while that VM is running on that host. Because the moment that VM moves and switches hosts, you have a completely different device there that wasn't replicating the data from that other from that other host that you were sitting on top of, and now you've effectively lost all that data, ephemeral data, indeed, right? Whatever you place in them in Azure or AWS or GCP or whatever cloud provider you're using. The devices that I have at the bottom, and again, I picked pure storage representative devices here, uh, are a block device, right? A block storage array. The one on the left is pure storage flash array. And the one on the right is pure storage flash blade, which is a NAS, more like a NAS device. They call it file and object, uh, but it's really a fancy NAS with object capabilities. Um, the, the, one on the, the one on the left, on, on the bottom left, uh, can do really great uh, 
millisecond you know, uh, under a millisecond latency for IO, and it can, I can still do a lot of throughput at that low latency. Um, it's it speaks a multitude of protocols. You have a lot of alternatives to this device, right? Uh, 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 EMC, Dell EMC would love to sell you something called uh, Power Store that is the analogous to what uh, Pure Storage Pure Storage sells. NetApp would love to sell you their one of their AF or EF or A's that are similar to to that to that device as well. You know, there's a multitude of different offerings in that realm as well. There's also, you know, the one on the bottom right is more of a high throughput device, okay? And Pristuch's Flash Blade is a really good one, but you have offerings from NetApp, uh, tons of different offerings from NetApp that are throughput intensive devices, uh, tons of offerings from the EMC that are that are also very good at throughput, like Isilon, right? You may have a Revisilon, it's a really good one. Um, data domain, still a th high throughput device, you know, that may not be very fond of that product, but guess what, it's actually fairly decent for what it does. Um, and so the block devices, right, the one on the top, on the top left, are all typically, these are the ones that were, you would typically place your database uh, files and transaction log files. Sometimes you want to take your transaction log backup really quickly, and you don't want to wait for, you know, that other device that sits out there. Um, Mr. Fenton, please just ask your question. You know, don't don't want you don't want to you want to wait for me to to acknowledge your 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 raised hand there. Uh, let's see. Can you talk a little bit more about the advantages of having a highly available system? Well, I mean, I was talking about storage devices. If you have your database files and transaction log files sitting on devices that are not highly available, guess what happens when you lose them? You lost them. Right? That data effectively has to be replicated somewhere else in order for you to transition your workload into that other box where the copy of the data exists. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have to do the sneaker net thing of plugging cards and plugging them on the other host, right? Um, that is the advantage is, you know, higher SL, uh, better SLAs, uh, better RTOs and better RPOs. Uh, that's really that's really the uh, the gist of this. Hopefully I answered your question there. If I, if I didn't, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, SLA service level agreement. Uh, very, very good point. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, what I was saying uh, before is that uh, you know the one the bottom left, flash arrays, fancy storage arrays. There's a there's a whole slew of them. All right. Pure storage is far from being the only one out there. Regardless, these devices can be very good. Uh, on-premises on for running SQL Server databases on top of, maybe you, you know, not only did you place your transaction log backups in your database back, and sorry, your data files and your transaction log files in them, but maybe you also put your backups in them before they get shipped to something else, like the device that sits on the on the top, on the bottom right, like a high throughput device, right? So, because sometimes you want to have the backup as close to you as possible, or maybe the other device is faster in terms of throughput, than your actually primary device where your database sits, and you want to leverage that for your backups. You know, it depends on what combination of, of uh, performance you get from either side. You need to understand these things in order to make better decisions about as to where to place things for your SQL Server backup. And again, I apologize because these are pure storage specific devices, but you, the, I wanted to represent the realm of devices you can see. Now, there may be some of you on the line thinking, oh, what about hyperconverged? You know, I have Nutanix or I have Azure Style ACI and there are some devices and the blah, blah, blah. This is a completely different thing, okay? Hyperconverged hyper uh, infrastructures are basically those that mix or try to minimize interconnections between hosts by not having a dedicated storage network or a data network. And so they try to have everything in one kind of systems by trying to, Kind of put all compute storage and network together as much as possible, right? There's a lot of marketing in those in those statements. You know, the hyperconverger hyperconverged vendors would love to sell you a storage only nodes, and at that point, that looks like a sand. And they even have, uh, you know, uh, political statements around those as well. Regardless, they can be very good for running your workload, but Oh, vSAN, by the way, that's the other one that's very common to hear about. Like vSAN is great for SQL Server 
blah, blah, blah. Look, it may be so, okay? I, I just don't have experience uh, with hyperconverged systems to talk about them or say much about them, other than I would compete against them when I was working for Pure Storage and they never did great for SQL high or high end SQL Server um, uh, workloads. That's just a fact of life. Not even Microsoft's own Azure Stack HCI would do great in terms of performance for high-end SQL Server workloads. That has been my experience. I don't have a skin in the game anymore, so I don't really care. Um, you know, if somebody gets mad out there about my statements or my or, or my opinions regarding hyperconverged systems, I would say that in general, you want to lean top left, right? You want to lean toward those devices that are extremely low latency, very high bandwidth. But the problem with those, remember, is that you have to replicate that data somehow. And that replication, if made synchronous, will guess what? Add on to latency, right? Because you now have to wait for synchronous replication of whatever you wrote, even if you wrote it very, very fast. And so that's just the nature of a beast. And so what I'm really looking forward to in the future is a future where we have amazingly fast storage devices that can be accessed as if they were memory devices and get automatically uh, magically replicated to another uh, such device with extreme low latency, breaking all the laws of physics and be quantum based. Right? Like that's all I want. Regardless, uh, folks, I uh, the, the last slide that I had for you guys today, and with this, I promise I'll, I'll let you all go uh, or I won't take any more of your time. Um, it's this philosophical discussion of block replication versus logical replication. And I'll make it quick. Look, there's a whole slew of things. Oops, sorry about that. There's a whole set of technologies that exist for replication of your, of your data from SQL Server into something else, right? So SQL Server to SQL Server, use replication, use AGs, use lock shipping, use all of that stuff. That's all great, right? They have their applicability. They have their place. It may be the best solution for what you want to do. But I want you guys to sometimes consider letting go of the baby and telling your storage admin or your VM admin, just replicate this stuff for me because I don't care, right? I care that it gets done in at gigabytes per second and not megabytes per second. That is the tip. That is a, something that is a fact of life, okay? Block replication that it's mindless and dumb as it possibly can get and can replicate data as fast as it goes from point A to point B, right? I got some a buffer of data. I replicate it, boom, boom, boom. I don't crack open that buffer update and look into it to see what I actually have to replicate, which is exactly what happens with logical replication, right? You're looking at sets of data, going through a stack to get things to get replicated, blah, 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 complex code inside A, complex code inside B. If I can just rely on my storage subsystem to just replicate stuff as fast as it can possibly be replicated, why wouldn't I do that? And so a lot of us have been kind of brainwashed into this you know, you got to use availability groups all the time and you got to use log shipping all the time, blah, blah, blah. You know what? Sometimes it's just easier to rely on your storage subsystem to do things. So matter of fact, think about what Azure does or AWS or GCP or Oracle do. Uh, do. All of them do. When it comes to high availability of their, of their own stuff, they're replicating their storage, right? Because they don't want to have, you know, you deploy this VM that actually does the replication of so forth and so on. You know, sometimes they will sell you that too. Like Oracle will sell you anything these days, right? Um, but they have done that for over for decades, and why would they would they do any differently now? Point is, they if you have a facility for replicating data in bulk, bandwidth intensive, why wouldn't you use that and on top of, on top of you know whatever fancy logical replication technology you want to use? If all you want is your data replicated, and that 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 technology can offer you pretty good guarantees on data on data recovery and you know RPOs and RTOs. Why wouldn't you use that? You know, people get hung up on, oh, but I have this other SQL Server instance over there and I don't want to no, I don't want to rely on this. And I don't really talk to the VM admin. I don't really talk to the storage admin. Like you guys need to get over get over all that. Okay. You need to talk to people. Just like, you know, unfortunately we 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 as humans, there's nothing else for us to do to, than interact with other humans, right? That literally have to do that at work too, right? You have, you have to talk to your VM admin, talk to your storage admin, and tell them, hey, look, guys, I'm doing this, 
but I'm really not getting great throughput. Or God, you know, God forbid you're running into the situation that your availability groups, uh, you know, redo queue is measured in like hours. I've seen that. And uh, so the point I'm trying to make is if you have something that just ships bytes fast, use it. So most of the time it makes sense to use it. Because guess what? You're probably don't, not, not even paying like additional licensing or anything like that. Just do that. Okay, so consider that aspect of things too. As you're designing developer systems, that's just something that you know should be like top of mind for you guys. You know, whether do you want to use logical replication or uh, or block based replication, storage based replication. All right, that said, I wanted to thank you guys again for giving me a chance to speak to you all. Uh, thank you. My email address is there. My LinkedIn is there. My Twitter comes with a warning uh, because uh, yes, I. Uh, occasionally throw the profane tweet here and there. Uh, they're funny though. I try to keep them funny. Um, but anyway, I, you know, let's connect. Um, I'm always eager to hear about you guys and what you do. And, and you know, we all learn from each other. Clearly, this is you know one one way that we do so, right? Like we do these presentations for user groups and stuff. Just like that, let's keep the conversation going. Whether here on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever your favorite way of communicating with other humans is. Happy to happy to hear from you all. Thanks you guys for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh, great presentation. I would like to encourage folks to if you have any questions to send them through to our genus when you when you think of them. Um, just like my Twitter has a warning on it. It's, I mean, it's we're real people. We have we have multiple sides to us. So thank you again. Uh, it was a great in-depth discussion. As I mentioned earlier, we are recording this, so I am just going to press stop. If I can find the button and